All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. All right. Having just discussed the different waveforms that we can get by transducing along the path of the PA catheter, we do need to quickly review over the normal hemodynamic values that we would expect to see. And when we talk about the normal hemodynamic values, we can think of them in two categories. Those which we directly measure and then obtain our values directly, and those which are calculated or derived from other values we directly measure. Now, when it comes to these values and really what's considered normal, um, know that this really truly varies depending on the source of the information that you're using. I'm going to do my best to use the most widely accepted values, um, but certainly from facility to facility, provider to provider, that they may have slightly different quote-unquote normal values. All right, so let's start off talking about the values that we get directly measuring them. So here I'm going to quote the values for spontaneously breathing patients, um, but know that those that are on mechanical ventilation are going to have changes to either the values that we expect to be normal or the way in which we get them. For reading values in spontaneously breathing patients, we're going to get our readings at the end of inspiration, while for mechanically ventilated patients on positive pressure ventilation, that we're going to be getting the reading at the end of expiration. Both of these times are when the pressure that's in the patient's lungs are most closely matching that of atmospheric air. All right, and so again, here's our handy-dandy diagram of the heart. And again, we're going to follow the path of the PA catheter and identify these different pressures and the normal values. So as you know, first we have the right atrial pressure, or our CVP. And here our value is just a single number. Um, our normal for our spontaneously breathing patient is going to be 2 to 6 millimeters of mercury. That said, for vented patients, it's certainly going to depend on the level of PEEP that they have, but typically anywhere from 8 to 12 millimeters of mercury is what's considered normal due to that increase in intrathoracic pressure. All right, moving right along from the right atrium, we go to our RV pressure. And here this is going to consist of a systolic and a diastolic pressure. We do also get a mean pressure, but it's not something that we, we really use. Um, here, the normal for our RV systolic is going to be 15 to 25 millimeters of mercury. And then for our RV diastolic, that this is going to drop all the way down anywhere from 0 to 8 millimeters of mercury. Now, continuing on from there, we enter the pulmonary artery. So we have our pulmonary artery pressure. And here we're going to have our systolic pulmonary artery pressure, our diastolic pulmonary artery pressure, and then our mean pulmonary artery pressure. Now for our systolic here, this is going to be just like in the RV. We're going to normally see 15 to 25 millimeters of mercury. For our diastolic though, this is of course higher than we see in the RV as we discussed in that previous lesson. And so here normal is going to be 8 to 15 millimeters of mercury. And then for our mean pressure, this is normally 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury. And then finally with our PA cath, we have the wedge pressure. So whether we're calling this the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, the pulmonary artery wedge pressure, or the pulmonary artery occlusive pressure. But here, like the right atrial pressure CVP, this is just gonna be a single value. And here our normal value is six to 12 millimeters of mercury. Now from here, assuming that we have a catheter that's capable of doing so, we also can measure cardiac output and then get a cardiac index, which is a cardiac output normalized for our patient's body surface area or basically their size. So a normal cardiac output is gonna be four to eight liters per minute while a normal cardiac index is going to be 2.5 to 4 liters per minute per meter squared. All right, and so that's all the values that we can really measure from our PA catheter. Now, in order to fully be able to calculate all the hemodynamic parameters um, that we're really looking for, we're going to need one more direct measure, which we get ideally from an arterial line, but we can also use a non-invasive blood pressure cuff. So with an arterial blood pressure, again, as you know, we've got a systolic, a diastolic, and a mean pressure, and our normal blood pressure is going to be 120 over 80 with a MAP greater than 60. Okay, so now with all those measured values, we can then calculate out a whole host of other hemodynamic values. 
And so the first one that we're going to talk about is stroke volume. And here this is the volume of blood that's ejected with each beat. Um, and this value can also be indexed just like cardiac output and cardiac index using that patient's body surface area. The way we do this calculation is we have our stroke volume is equal to our cardiac output divided by our heart rate times 1,000. And here our normal stroke volume is 60 to 100 milliliters, while our normal stroke index or stroke volume index, whatever you want to call it, is 35 to 65 milliliters per beat per meter squared. All right, the next hemodynamic parameter is something that we call stroke work. And stroke work is really the amount of work that's done by the ventricle to eject a volume of blood and is a representation of the force that's applied by the ventricle to that volume of fluid. So we can think of this as how much work the heart is able to do to move fluid along. And this is really a, a product of both the mean pressure of whatever vasculature that heart is ejecting into. So whether that's a mean arterial pressure or a mean pulmonary artery pressure, but it's that pressure in relation to where our starting preload pressure began, as well as how much volume of blood was ejected. So that might be a little confusing, but hopefully that'll make sense in a second here. So basically this can be used to assess ventricular function for both the left and the right side of the heart. Now, given normally that both the right and left pump the same amount of blood, um, the left obviously has to overcome higher pressures and resistance in that aorta and the systemic vasculature, and thus it has a larger chamber, and it really does more work to eject the same volume of blood. Now, to get the value, we subtract the preload pressure from the mean vascular pressure and then multiply that by the stroke volume. And so, like I said, we can calculate it out for both the right and the left heart, and then both of those can be indexed with body surface area. And so first, if we look at our right ventricle stroke work, that this is going to be equal to our stroke volume times our pulmonary artery mean pressure minus our right atrial pressure, and then multiply all that by 0 0.0136. And then for our left ventricle stroke work, that this is, again, stroke volume times this is going to be our mean arterial pressure minus our left ventricular end diastolic pressure, which in many cases we're just going to substitute the wedge pressure here for our LVEDP, and then again multiply that by 0 0.0136. And we're multiplying by this number. Um, it's really a constant to get everything on the same scale. Now, to get our right ventricle stroke work index and our left ventricle stroke work index, we simply use our stroke index or stroke volume index instead of just stroke volume in that calculation. Now, the normal values for our right ventricle stroke work is going to be 10 to 20. Then for our right ventricle stroke work index, that this is going to be 5 to 10. And then for our left ventricle stroke work, that this is going to be 60 to 130 while our left ventricle stroke work index is going to be 50 to 62. Now from here, we can also get something that we call cardiac work, uh, sometimes called cardiac minute work. Um, and here we simply use cardiac output or cardiac index instead of our stroke volume and stroke volume index in those calculations. Basically, this factors in the amount of work that's being done over time, as we also have that component of heart rate that gets factored into it. All right, and then finally from here, we can calculate out vascular resistance values for a couple key areas. Um, first is going to be our systemic vascular resistance, or our SVR. And this is essentially the resistance or the squeeze of the aorta uh, and that systemic vasculature that the left ventricle must pump against. We can think of this as our afterload. And so here we get this with the calculation SVR is equal to 80 times the difference between our MAP and our right atrial pressure, and then take all that and divide it by cardiac output. Now again, we can index to a patient's body surface area if we use cardiac index instead of cardiac output. So here our SVRI would be equal to this same calculation just with cardiac index as the final division. But here our normal SVR is 800 to 1200. And our normal SVRI, which is our indexed value, is going to be 1970 to 2390. And then next we have the pulmonary vascular resistance, or the PVR. And so here we can calculate the vascular resistance in the pulmonary artery, which is the afterload that the RV has to contract against. 
So similar calculation here. Uh, here we have PVR is equal to 80 times the difference between our mean pulmonary artery pressure and our left ventricle and diastolic pressure. So again, think we're going to probably use the wedge pressure here in place of that. And then divide all that by cardiac output. Again, we can index this with body surface area if we just divide everything by cardiac index, as you can see here. But here are normal values for our pulmonary vascular resistance is less than 250, while normal PVRI is 255 to 285. And then from there, with these values, there are many other things that can be calculated uh, related to hemodynamics and cardiac function, really. Um, but these are the most common ones that we often see and use. And so I did want to go over those, discuss those normal values. That way you guys know those and have those available. Because as we start to talk about some, some abnormalities that we can see, and as you see changes in your patient, you're really going to need to know where that normal is. Same with the normal appearance of the waveforms like we talked about in that last lesson in order to be able to decipher some of the changes that you see going on. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.